speaker, and it has been a privilege, yes. I've said so many times tonight, I cannot believe that we are here at this point. Eight years have just flown by. And uh, somebody said, yes, they go by quickly, and they don't. <laughs> they do, and they don't, and that is so true. Um, um, you know, the feeling that I have is certainly not one um, that I, I am the only one who has. You will hear from other staff members in just a few moments who feel the same way as I do. Following me, you will hear from Dr. Dana Hunter, who is the director of the Governor's Office of Human Trafficking Prevention. Then we'll hear from First Lady Donna Edwards, then Matthew Block, who is the former executive counsel for the governor, and then the man himself, Governor John Bell Edwards. Now, I know that staff will agree with, with me that we have been fortunate to see true servant leadership in action by both of them. They set the pace, and we had to keep up. And I cannot tell you how many times we said, how much longer can they go? Are they ever going to slow down? Where does that energy come from? Well, I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from the love and the compassion that they have for the people of Louisiana and always wanting to make life better and move our state forward. And I think you will agree with me that without a doubt, they have done just that. So tonight, we will take a look back at the challenges and the triumphs and we will celebrate the promises made and the progress delivered. Now the governor has said this on more than one occasion and I'm sure that you all have heard it and we completely agree with him. We have, we have said the best, he's always the one to say one of the best, one of the best if not the best first ladies in Louisiana history. So first up, someone who has worked closely with her on one of her top three initiatives which is eradicating human trafficking, please help me welcome Dr. Dana Hunter. Good evening, everyone. Psalm 37 and 23 reads, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Years ago, a beautiful soul named Donna Huto was born in Meridian, Mississippi, and somehow the almighty God ordered her steps to a small country town called Amy, Louisiana, where she would meet, <laughs> where she would meet her high school sweetheart, John Bell Edwards. The two would marry in 1989 not knowing that one day in their future, Donna Huto Edwards would become the anchor for her family and the rock for her husband, who would be named the 56th governor of the state of Louisiana. I think we would all agree, as Shauna just mentioned, that First Lady Donna Edwards has been no ordinary First Lady. She's used every minute and every second of her platform to be a strong advocate and champion for all children and families in our state. <laughs> Through her foundation, she provided music, arts, and movement education to thousands of children in schools across our state. She also provided leadership and support for more than 4,000 children and youth in our foster care system, ensuring that each child in Louisiana's foster care system has a safe and stable place to call home. First Lady Edwards also advocated for Louisiana's first monumental allocation of state funds to support child advocacy centers across the state of Louisiana, where nearly 6,000 children and youth victims of sexual exploitation receive services each year. Mrs. Edwards has also been a fierce champion in addressing human trafficking. With her leadership, Louisiana has gained national recognition and is now becoming a model for other states in addressing this crime. 
In 2021, First Lady Edwards established a national coalition for the prevention of human sex trafficking and welcomed first spouses to join her. Through her coalition and foundation, she's provided support for hundreds of human trafficking victims and has partnered with entities to train more than 6,000 professionals internationally, nationally, and statewide through her global summits and statewide trainings. She's also helped to finance and support global organizations such as the Santa Marta Group, as well as organizations right here in our own backyard that provide housing for human trafficking victims such as Metanoia Manor, Eden Centers, Covenant House, and others. These accolades, ladies and gentlemen, are just the tip of the iceberg. Donna Edwards has a heart for all people, regardless of their race or status. One of my most memorable moments in working with First Lady Edwards was when our grant was set to expire and we could no longer fund our Human Trafficking Survivor Council. So we were concerned, wondering, okay, how will this work continue where we bring survivor leaders to the table and help them, use them, and listen to their voice to inform our work? Well, many of us in this room have heard of Mars Bart's slogan, one call, that's all. <laughs> I think we need to borrow that for First Lady Edwards. <laughs> because with Donna Edwards, it's one call, that's all. <laughs> I reached out to her to ask if she could fund the council and she did not hesitate to cut the check. Not only did she not hesitate to financially support the council, she was present at each meeting and offered space at the governor's mansion to host these meetings. Many of us would agree that with Donna Edwards again, it's one call, that's all. In closing, I've had the privilege of working closely with Ms. Edwards over the last seven years. I've observed her to be selfless, hardworking, hardworking. <laughs> Did I say hardworking? <laughs> Very down to earth and a first lady who is not afraid to sit down and touch hands and empathize with society's most downtrodden citizens. She's a woman of faith, always showing the virtues of love, humility, and hospitality. With her husband's support, she helped to make the governor's mansion a house for all of Louisiana's citizens. As many of you here in this room will know, she's hosted events <laughs> and tours almost daily with warmth and grace. The scripture says, who can find a virtuous woman? Well, Governor, I think we would all agree that you have found one. Yeah. Without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce to you my dear friend, and I dare to say, again, as Shauna mentioned, one of the best first ladies Louisiana has ever known, Donna Huto Edwards. <laughs> to correct Dana. Dana, it's Hutto. <laughs> but I love you, Dana. Thank you, Dana. I appreciate you so much for that beautiful introduction. Hello, everyone. Hello. And thank you all for being here for tonight. It means so much to me and to John Bell and our whole family. Um, the last eight years have been nothing short of extraordinary. Serving as governor and as first lady has been an honor. And it has been a blessing, and it has been humbling for us both. And we could not have done it without the love, without the prayers, and from all of you and so many others, with all of our staff, with all of our friends, and with our family. And we're truly, truly grateful. Our lives have changed in incredible ways since 2015. John Miller. Our youngest, John Bell's over here, 
was in the eighth grade. Stand up, John Miller. Look how he's grown. And he will soon graduate from LSU. Yay. Sarah Ellen. Sarah Ellen, stand up. Um, our middle daughter, you're not supposed to say middle, but our, our, our second child um, was a student at LSU and is now um, working in DC and is married to Christopher Bates. Stand up, Christopher Bates. Our oldest daughter, Samantha, was in grad school um, and preparing for her wedding, the first wedding at the mansion. We you, know, you had two, you know. Um, and they, um, and she married Jonathan Rico. And ladies and gentlemen, um, she is on her way. Actually, she just arrived at the hospital in New Orleans <clears throat> and just checked in. So we will have a baby. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so if y'all see me checking my phone, that's why. So to say that we are excited um, is an understatement. Um, so we, uh, we're excited. So we have all heard the saying, there is no place like home. Um, there's no place like home. And I didn't wear my ruby slippers uh, shoes, but um, it is true. It's more about the people and the memories. And it feels wonderful to be back in the very place where we, we started here in our hometown of Amite. And this is where John Bell and I met. It's where we grew up in a loving, faith-filled home, um, built lifelong friendships here, learned important life lessons here, and raised our family. And we're so proud to call Amit and Rosalind our home. We really are. And when I think back to when John Bell and I first met as kids, literally kids, um, eighth grade, <laughs> seven, six, Maybe so. Um, yeah. Uh, never in our, my wildest dreams um, could I have imagined what was in store um, for us. But I always felt like he would do great things. Um, he really, we knew that he was going to do great things. And so I was latched onto that. Um, <laughs> the truth is, is that when John Bell answered the call to serve, um, so did our, our whole family. Um, and from serving in the Army, um, coming back here to Amy, serving in the community, um, to state representative, as then, of course, as governor, from Amy to Schofield Barracks, Hawaii, then to Georgia, on to North Carolina, from serving our country, then crisscrossing our great state from parish to parish, me being the driver. Um, <laughs> you know, as we were campaigning, traveling across our nation as in the world, really, as governor and first lady, promoting and representing um, our state, your state, Louisiana. We are immensely humbled by the trust and confidence that you all put in us to lead the state that we love so dearly. And we both know that none of this could be possible without our sweet parents. Our parents that provided a great and solid foundation for us, one built on faith and family and public service um, that mean everything to us. My mother, who is here tonight, Helen Hutto. Stand up, Mom. I want to thank her for, um, for loving me and being with me all the way through. Um, and although we have lost both of our fathers, um, John Bill's mother, last uh, January, um, we carry them in our hearts every single day. Uh, one of my favorite songs, um, I'm not going to say this right, Morin Morris, is that right? Morin Morris. I wrote about this in my, on my blog, Love in Louisiana. Um, two of my favorite lines are, when the bones are good, the rest don't matter. And the house don't fall when the bones are good. And John Bell and I counted a blessing to have raised, be raised in homes filled with good bones. Homes filled with God, prayer, love, and encouragement. 
And those are exactly the things that we have tried to impart in our own children, in our family, and in the work that we have done for the people of our great state. And we have taken our responsibility to serve you with all that we have and to offer this state the dedication of service it deserves through our time and our effort. We have always strived to do better, to be good, and make you proud. You know, I came into the office of First Lady not knowing everything I wanted to focus on and not having a job description either. Um, but making the Governor's Mansion a place that all Louisianas could be proud of and a focus on education were always at the forefront. I wanted to use my platform to make a difference in the lives of women, in the lives of children and families. And after much prayer and conversations, I started my Louisiana First Foundation and my three initiatives evolved over time. Teach man. I always say ma'am. Yes ma'am, no ma'am, thank you ma'am. A word of respect in the South and the military. Teach ma'am. When Louisiana, Then we had the Louisiana Fosters. And finally a focus on the prevention and raising awareness of human sex trafficking. Most if not everyone knows that I began my career as an elementary music teacher. First in Roseland, some of you may not know that, in a little broom closet. Um, and then on to Amy Elementary and then to um, Southeastern Lab School in Hammond. And that's when I became a very big advocate and believing that teaching to the whole child and how important that is. Countless studies show how music and arts and education support and enhance the other core subjects. The arts actually help increase scores of subjects like math and English and science. And the arts are also incredibly therapeutic for children who have had traumatic experiences. Once a teacher, always a teacher. And so I created the Teach Ma'am, which stands for Music Art Movement. We created an ambassador program, provided grants to help teachers connect students and educators with Louisiana artists, and much more. And my plans are to continue this work by keeping the conversation going on the need for arts in our schools. I also plan to work with our area schools to share the importance of all three areas. Last month, we had the pleasure of hosting in the Louisiana Governor's Mansion, Louisiana native and Grammy award-winning musician and artist, John Baptiste at the Governor's Mansion. Yes. And John Baptiste is the perfect example of why we need to keep music, art, and music in our school curriculums. There is a John Baptiste in every school in this state. And that is why we need to encourage there to be more music in our schools. Encouraging and nurturing children is important. Also encouraging and nurturing children in our foster care system is what led to the launch of Louisiana Fosters, working with the Department of Children and Family Services and other state and national organizations. It helps connect foster children and parents to a supportive network of resources from government, nonprofit, community, business, and faith-based groups. You know, I remember when our state faced historic flooding in 2016. John Bell's calendar cleared as he was leading the state's emergency response. But the only meeting he kept was with Wendy's wonderful kids. And as a result of that one meeting, Louisiana was chosen. There was five states chosen. And out of those five states, Louisiana, one of those five was chosen. And they brought in additional caseworkers to help find homes for the hardest to place kids. And those with siblings who are older or had learning disabilities. And in 2016, John Bill came to me and he said, Donna, you're not going to believe this, but 735 children have been adopted out of the foster care program system this year. <laughs> and he said, he told me, and it probably will never be that high again ever. And that was amazing achievement to be proud of. And I thought to myself, yes, that's amazing. But he should know me my down. And I'm a praying woman and a wife. And guess what? The numbers continue to be amazing. And in 2017, 771 children were adopted. In 2018, 912 were adopted. 
And that was the highest number in a single year. And the numbers have fluctuated over the years. And even in COVID-19, it was incredible. Children were adopted at high numbers. And in 2020, there were 756 children adopted. There are more than 600 um, to date. Over 6,000 foster children over the last eight years have been adopted out of the foster care program. And that is powerful, and that is something that we all should be proud of and something that we should be encouraging our DCFS workers about. They should be encouraged because they are the one, they're the ones who are doing the hard work um, each and every day. And we supported, John Bell and I supported them, supported important legislation, including extending the age of children that can stay in foster care from 18 to 21. That is huge. Yes. Um, it launched the Louisiana Fosters and encouraged civic and faith leaders and organizations to get involved. One of our um, signature programs under the Louisiana Fosters is One Church, One Family, One Child. And the idea came when I learned that at any given time in Louisiana, um, there's nearly about 4,000 children in the foster care program any given day in Louisiana. And there's about 4,000 children in our foster care program, and there's about 4,000 churches in Louisiana any given time. Um, in 4,000 churches in Louisiana, although I asked Google one day, how many churches in Louisiana, and Google says there's 7,000. But so it really is a simple thing. If every church in our state would recruit one good family and that family would take in, and a family would go through the foster care program and take in a child, we could take that, those, those children and that church wrap themselves around that child and that family. We could take care of the foster care and the children in our in our our state, y'all, that just that one program. So talk to your churches. We can do this. So I am grateful to all the churches that have already gotten involved. I mean, we've already got a lot of churches involved. So thank you if you've been doing that work. So thank you. Um, addressing the very real problem of human trafficking is my third major area of focus. And John Bell and I have made it our mission to help end this terrible crime and help survivors regain, regain control of their lives. And we're not going to stop now. I am proud to announce, drum roll, that Dr. Dana Hunter, stand up, Dr. Hunter. <laughs> Dr. Hunter is, um, is going to run my Louisiana Foster, uh, Louisiana Foster's program, but she's going to be the director of my Louisiana First Foundation. So I want to say thank you. She has already put in such hard work. She's already put me to work. She says I work hard. She's incredible. Um, and she's going to take it to a whole different level. And um, it's going to be an amazing um, foundation from here on out. Um, here is why the work must go on. The average age of a traffic victim in our state is 13 years old. And it happens in big cities, in small towns, and it happens in a meet and everywhere in between and it happens in plain sight which is why we need to continue shining a light on this dark and heinous crime i believe that god puts us in these positions to serve him and helping others and john bell and i am proud to have helped launch metanoia manor which she mentioned which is a safe haven for those who have been victimized and is the only one of its kind in the country, and we hope it will serve as a blueprint for others to duplicate. I volunteer and I talk with these young girls about their hopes and their dreams through teaching them how to play, with, play the piano, making jewelry, uh, painting. We've had important conversations. And by the way, those activities, those are music and art, and those are therapeutic. And these young girls, it has been an honor to have been a part in bringing healing into their lives. Since 2017, I've hosted several summits, both in person and virtual, bringing experts from the Vatican and professionals from all over Louisiana and the country who have already been working in this field to share best practices and collaborate on ways we could all work as a more united force. Working with first spouses from several states, we have formed the National Coalition for the Prevention of Human Sex Trafficking. We launched the first statewide human trafficking awareness campaign during the NCAA Final Four Championship in New Orleans in 2022. Louisiana is a leader in human trafficking prevention and awareness because of the work we have done 
I'm especially proud of the work John Bell has done with state lawmakers of every political party enacting some of the toughest laws, toughest laws in the country that hold the perpetrators accountable and help the survivors. There's so much more that I could share, but we would be here all night. Suffice it to say that I am very thankful to everyone who has helped us and partnered with us. We have made many strides, but there is much more to do, and so our work is not over. You know, when one door closes, another opens. Today, this week, we are finishing up the chapters in this book of our lives. But the rest, <clears throat> but the rest of the stories and books in the series are still being written. John Bell and I are excited. We're excited about returning home, being closer to family and our new grandbaby and friends. And I want to close with a short and favorite scripture that has been a guiding light. Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46.10. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22. And lastly, although it's not a scripture, leave it better than you find it. Leave it better than you found it. And I do. And John Belt does. And we have tried to do our best to do that throughout our time, our last eight years. And to John Bell, to the love of my life. As we walk into the sunset together, I pray that this next leg of our journey will be as exciting as the last, with less hurricanes <laughs> and with less trauma <laughs> and with a lot of beach walks. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Louisiana. Thank you. We love you. God bless you. Each and every one of you. Thank you. It's my honor tonight to, to be with you, to be able to introduce the governor of Louisiana tonight. In, in this, the waning days, the last week of his time is the 56th governor of Louisiana. And I know that none of you showed up here tonight. And by the way, thank you, all of you, for showing up here tonight. I know that none of you came here tonight to hear from me and that all of you came to hear from our incredible first lady and the governor. So I promise I will be brief. Um, but before I talk about the governor, I just want to say a few things about our first lady and not just because she is an incredibly hard act to follow. Um, but I think all of you saw just now what you've known for eight years. What an incredible person she is and how dedicated she is to the job of First Lady and why she is so universally revered and admired in this state. And not just in the state, but across the country. But what I know most of you know, those of you that know these two people, is how much their marriage is a true partnership and how she was with him each and every day of his time for these last eight years. She has been the true North Star of our administration and Louisiana will miss you. So eight years ago this week is the governor was waiting to be inaugurated on the steps of the Capitol and waiting to put his hand on his family Bible and become the governor of Louisiana. His friend and West Point classmate, Murray Starkle, introduced him. 
And in so doing, in describing his friend of 30 years, Murray read a part of the West Point Cadet Prayer. And it, what he read was, make us choose the harder right instead of the easier wrong. I've thought a lot about that, those words, for the last eight years. They struck me that day and they continue to strike me today. Um, and I can tell you without hesitation, as I stand here tonight, that through some of the darkest moments in Louisiana's history, the governor has both lived his life and led this state choosing the right path. Though sometimes the easier path, the, the wrong path, would have been the easy one to take that road. But instead, he made the difficult decisions. Now, I know that shortly when he comes up here, the governor is going to talk about all the things that he has done as governor and how Louisiana, by almost every measure, is a better place than it was eight years ago. But for me, and I'm sure for so many of you, I think of this more personally. Because we in Louisiana have been incredibly blessed to have a governor who is a man of integrity, who is a man of honor and courage and character. A man who woke up every day of his eight years hard at work, doing his best to make Louisiana a better place. Through a historic budget crisis, through floods, through three of the most significant hurricanes to ever hit the Louisiana coast, through a once in a century pandemic that claimed the lives of too many of our brothers and sisters. The governor, ever optimistic, ever confident in the path that we were on, led us onward and through. And now he can come back home. And he can take solace in the words of Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. As I look around this room tonight and see so many faces of those of you who, who have known this family for so long, who have worked through the campaigns together, who have worked for the governor and with the governor these eight years, for this man we all so deeply admire, I am confident that I can say for all of you that it has been the honor of our lifetimes to be able to work for the people of Louisiana with and for you. So ladies and gentlemen, and, and it is especially appropriate that this be here tonight in his home parish that is so near and dear to his heart. I'd like to introduce to you my friend, the governor of the great state of Louisiana, John Bell Evans. Good evening, everybody. Thank y'all so much for coming out tonight and joining Donna and me and our hometown of Amy. I look across the room and into this crowd I see family, friends, neighbors, strangers um, who supported and encouraged me uh, since day one. Uh, and as y'all probably know, this town is where I first learned the importance of faith, family, hard work. 
Uh, it's where my mama, a charity hospital nurse, and papa, one of four sheriffs in our family, taught me the value of public service. I grew up here with the best, most loving and supportive siblings who worked so hard to ensure our success. And so before I go further, I want to say to Alice, to Frank, to Clay, to Andrew, to Morgan, and to Daniel, I love y'all all so very much. And contrary to what the First Lady said, Amy, this we're in the seventh grade. <laughs> I met a sweet, beautiful schoolmate who I knew not long after that would be the love of my life. Uh, she's obviously here with me tonight, just as she has been every day since. Uh, so give me a second to brag on Donna. And I know I'm biased. I'm not objective. But she's the best first lady in Louisiana history. In my book. And as she said, there's no job description for that position. But that didn't stop her. She identified the areas that she was passionate about. She used her creativity. She got busy connecting people across the state, even across the nation, and more recently across the globe to work with her. And she's done an absolutely outstanding job. Uh, she is a true champion for children, for women, for families, uh, from elevating the importance of music, art, and movement in school, uh, to providing a supportive network for foster children and families. She's worked tirelessly to help prevent and raise awareness about human trafficking. And she's accomplished so much for our state. And she did all of that while also preserving the history and restoring the beauty of the governor's mansion. Uh, the improvements that she's made will be there for generations to enjoy. So needless to say, Donna inspires me every day. She prays with me every day. I could not have asked for a better partner in life or a better mother to our children, uh, two of whom are here, as you know, Sarah Ellen and John Miller. Uh, Samantha Bell is at the hospital. I'm expecting we'll be there pretty soon. <laughs> uh, and my, our children have been absolute troopers. You all need to know this. Politics is, is really fairly hostile these days. It's nasty. And the family takes it much more seriously than the politicians and the office holders. But they have been absolute troopers through the last 10 years and a great blessing to us. And I love y'all as well. <laughs> Don and I are so proud to represent this area, to be back in our hometown of Amy. This is where we raised our children. We now look forward to being grandparents. This is where my brother... My father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather has served as sheriff. This is the district that first entrusted me to represent them in elective office. And I have worked hard to maintain that trust every single day in every decision that I've made. And that is why I wanted my final speech as governor to be here with you where it all began. None of our success would have been possible without the people of Amy Tangsville Parish, without the people in this room. I'll never forget the day I was sitting in the legislature and I was talking to my good friend Sam Jones, telling him that I'd had enough of the governor we had at the time. I felt he was leading us into a crippling budget crisis, the extent of which we really didn't fully understand at that time. Students were fleeing the state because of the largest disinvestment to higher education in the country. Uh, one of the nation's largest percentages of working poor people were being deprived of health insurance that was readily available if you just said yes. Business as usual, politics was holding us back. So I looked at Sam and I said, I'm running for governor. Now, not many people believed that I could win. But choosing the path was never about power. It was never about proving a point. It wasn't about politics. Truthfully, it wasn't even about me, it was about people, people like everybody here tonight. And I'm so proud of this room because this room looks like the state of Louisiana. You know, the <laughs> diversity is important to me, it always has been important to me. And I'm proud to say that we have had 
the most diverse and the most competent administration in state history with the cabinet, the boards, the commissioners, the staff that look like the state of Louisiana. And I would say their quality is inextricably linked to that diversity. Now let's go back to 2016. It's a little unpleasant. But let's talk about the challenges that we've met, the progress we've delivered over the last eight years. Because my story is your story, and I want to tell all of you of what we've been able to accomplish for Louisiana by working together. And every single thing we've done, in contrast to what's happening across the country and certainly in Washington, D.C., has been on a bipartisan basis. Uh, now, spoiler alert. We're going to wrap up, and I'm going to tell you that our state is much better off today than it was eight years ago. And this is true. This is true in numerous critically important and objectively verifiable ways. And in fact, I'm going to tell you we're not just better, because in some ways that was a pretty low bar. <laughs> we're the strongest and the best we've ever been in many, many of these measures. When I took office, the state had a $2 billion deficit and a grand total of $400 million in the Budget Stabilization Fund. I'm leaving with a balanced budget and more than $3 billion in two reserve accounts. The Budget Stabilization Fund, also known as the Rainy Day Fund, now by itself has a billion dollars, more than it has ever had in our history. And there's another fund that didn't exist until 2016, and we created it. It's the Revenue Stabilization Fund. It has more than $2.2 billion in that fund. The news keeps getting better. Last year, we ran a $300 million surplus that will be available for the next governor and legislature. We have $91.4 million excess revenue in the current fiscal year, and the forecast for next year went up by $100 million. We have addressed the fiscal situation of our state. And simply put, we are in excellent financial shape. Uh, and these savings have been accomplished while we are investing in our critical priorities again. We're paying record amounts to the pension systems, unfunded accrued liability. We're uh, retiring debt. We're paying judgments. You name it. Uh, I want to talk about education for a moment. You know, the primary reason I ran for governor in the first place was because of those disinvestments. Well, we've given teachers a total of $5,300 in raises and $2,650 for support workers. We have significantly increased funding for early childhood education. In fact, more, more state general fund, more state general fund in the current budget for early childhood than ever in our history. And I'm going to, I'm going to go off script for a minute, a minute. We all want better educational outcomes for our kids. If we will just keep investing in early childhood for a generation and see those kids get all the way through school, we will be there. We will be there. We're also making higher, I'm sorry, historic investments in higher education, including an increase of $465 million in recurring funding for operational expenses of our community technical colleges and our universities. And we're doing this through honest budgeting practices that are fiscally sound, uh, budgets that adequately fund our most critical priorities. Uh, we've operated state government in a cost-effective, efficient, and transparent manner. How do I know we're the most transparent administration in history? Because Bobby Jindal, Jindal wouldn't sign the bill including the governor's office in those transparency initiatives until he was on the way out and I was on the way in. I'm the only one that's ever, <laughs> ever operated on it. But that's to better serve taxpayers, to attract new businesses and investors, to ensure a high quality of life for the people of Louisiana. Uh, and that is a huge difference uh, from my predecessor's days of smoke and mirrors budgeting uh, fund sweeps, one-time money for recurring expenditures, incessant budget cuts, only to be followed by mid-year cuts. In contrast, here as I walk out the door for the last time, we have produced surpluses every single year that I've been running. <laughs> so 
So I think it's appropriate that I pause for just a moment and thank Jay Darden and all the people at the Division of Administration, the wonderful staff for that excellent work. And over the last eight years, the growth of the state general fund has been less than inflation. Because sometimes when I'm out talking to groups and I'm talking about how we gave teachers pay raises, how we expanded Medicaid, how we have grown our investments in early childhood and higher education and all these other things, I said, well, that's fine, but how much did you grow government? By less than the rate of inflation over the eight years. And we're making progress on other fronts, too. I'm very proud to say that our unemployment rate is the lowest ever measured for the month of November, 3.5%. Unemployment has never been as low in this time of year than it is right now. I'm very proud of that. And by the way, we keep beating our own records month after month. I'm also proud to tell you that in the third quarter, Louisiana's gross domestic product grew faster than 45 other states at a rate of 6.6%. .6%. The national rate was 4.9%. Our real GDP was higher than many other states, including southern states like Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Virginia, and Florida. And I can name them again if you want me to. <laughs> But something else I'm really proud of is the fact that we replenished our unemployment trust fund. Uh, you know, coming out of COVID, that, that fund, had, fund had been depleted with that rapid rise in, in the number of unemployed uh, Louisiana workers. Uh, and there's a law that says if you go below $100 million in the, in the trust fund, there's a solvency tax on businesses that the state has to impose. Well, because of COVID, we were certainly in, headed in that direction. But I insisted that wouldn't happen. We came together. Uh, we replenished the fund without taxing employers more. That fund today is at $924 million and forecast the forecast for August of next year. I'm sorry, August of this year because we're 2024 is almost exactly where it was going into COVID, $1.1 billion. Um, and we're making monumental investments in critical infrastructure. Uh, we've allocated nearly $5.5 billion to more than 2,000 projects around the state, including nearly 7,000 miles of road improvements. And by the way, while we're on the topic of transportation, Louisiana certainly has not been shortchanged by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, this was the most uh, important piece of legislation on infrastructure to come out of Washington since we did the interstate highway system. But based on fund formula funding alone, Louisiana will receive $7.5 billion. That's 16th in per capita funding formula. By the way, we're 25th in the country in per capita population, right? So we're 16th, uh, and that's 12th in, in, in resilient funding uh, that we've received. And, and let me just tell you, we are, we are putting those dollars to work uh, for their highest and best use. Uh, over $10.1 billion in bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act funding has been announced for Louisiana. Uh, this includes $1.29 billion for resilience of infrastructure, much of which is allocated to protect Louisiana's coast through grants to CPRA, but also through direct federal spending by the Army Corps of Engineers. And speaking of the bipartisan infrastructure law, we committed years ago to closing the digital divide by 2029. Uh, that was the result of a task force that I created uh, to study rural areas of Louisiana uh, the, so that we could revitalize those areas. And one of the things they came up with at the top of the list, we've got to make sure there's high-speed affordable internet all over our state. Just a few weeks ago, I announced that Louisiana is absolutely leading the country in putting that bipartisan infrastructure law broadband funding to work. We're the first state in the nation to receive our funding allocation, setting a model for other states. That's $1.35 billion that our state will have to end that digital divide by 2029 so that every residence, every business in the state of Louisiana has affordable high-speed internet. Now let's talk about the progress we've made in economic development. 
We've announced more than 261 economic development projects representing $94 billion in capital investment across our state. Those projects will result in the creation of 80,000 plus direct and indirect jobs. Uh, we've expanded programs to create small business contract opportunities with the state. We're supporting women and minority uh, entrepreneurs, promoting small businesses owned by military veterans and gold star spouses. I see a military veteran right here in front of me uh, tonight. Thank you very much, Lewis, for being here. Hudson Initiative expenditures with disadvantaged businesses increased nearly 300 percent between 2016 and 2022, from $32 million to $90.5 million. In 2016, I signed an executive order to rein in and reform the industrial tax exemption program that was more generous than it needed to be. So now, instead of the 100 percent exemption from ad valorem taxes, property taxes that ran for 10 years, it's now an 80% exemption for a five-year term with the option for another five-year term if the manufacturer meets all of their obligations. And we tied this exemption to job creation and we gave locals a voice. This is especially appropriate because it's only local dollars at issue. The state doesn't levy a property tax. And there were fears that these ITEP reforms would reduce capital investment in the state. But not only were those fears unfounded, they were exactly wrong. ITEP projects average $10 billion a year pre-reform, and post-reform, they've averaged $25 billion, giving local governments a say in whether their property taxes are exempted has it proven extremely beneficial to communities and to the state. In fact, locals have realized more than $750 more in revenue to fund police and fire protection, education, local roads and bridges than they would have had we not reformed the program. Louisiana's manufacturing jobs, the gold standard indicator of economic health due to their positive ripple effect across the economy, ended 2022 at their highest level in seven years. Uh, we have successfully implemented an all of the above energy strategy that leveraged the only climate action plan in the Gulf South to drive new in energy investments while continuing to support companies that meet current market demand for oil and gas. Uh, just last week, the EPA gave Louisiana primacy in Class 6 well permitting, just the third state in the nation uh, to get primacy. And this will allow us to reduce CO2 emissions, grow the economy, and create jobs, all in furtherance of our climate action plan. Thank you. And the result of these efforts is that Louisiana is now a global leader in the energy transition and a major international player in the booming LNG market. Economist Lauren Scott predicted a few weeks ago that Louisiana will add 80,000 new jobs in 2024 and 2025, thanks in large part to the huge investments we are seeing across the state in clean energy projects. Uh, we capitalized on coastal restoration efforts to establish Louisiana as an international water management industry hub anchored by the water campus in Baton Rouge. We've completed 72 projects, we've started 82 more, and we have procured $12.5 billion in coastal funding. We're diversifying our economy. We've supported investments in emerging sectors such as tech, cybersecurity, life sciences, aerospace, and reinvestments in logistics assets like the $1.8 billion Louisiana International Terminal Container Facility at the Port of New Orleans. And I'm immensely proud that my first act as governor was to expand Medicaid. Today, more than a half million of our working poor Louisiana brothers and sisters have access to health care who otherwise wouldn't have it. And I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again here tonight. Medicaid expansion was the easiest big decision that I made in the Office of Governor. Because of that decision, our uninsured rate is now below the national average. The state has saved money that helped address our fiscal problems. Hospitals and other providers are better reimbursed. And across our state, not a single rural hospital has closed. That is a far cry from the situation of some of our neighboring states. In 2017, we advanced bipartisan criminal justice reform 
We reduced our incarceration rate from 760 per 100,000 in 2016 to 564 in 2021, which is the latest data that we have. And I said we would do this when I ran for governor, not knowing if I could deliver, but on my way out the door, I can tell you Louisiana does not have the nation's highest incarceration rate. We enacted data-driven reforms based on best practices focused on nonviolent and non-sex offenders. And we did all this while also overcoming some of the worst natural disasters in Louisiana history and a global pandemic. And speaking of the pandemic, I'm just going to tell you, all you become governor, I guess you signed up for what comes your way. <laughs> that one was hard. That one was really hard, but I will tell you, we were blessed in Louisiana to have truly wonderful and competent and caring public servants who were experts in their field at the Department of Health, in the Office of Public Health, and I want to thank Dr. Courtney Phillips. I want to thank Steve Russo and Dr. Joe Cannon. If it looked like I was calm and collected <laughs> and somewhat knowledgeable, it was only because of their tremendous work. You know, somebody counted these up, but there were over 244 emergencies over the last eight years, right at 50 state emergency declarations and more than 20 federal disaster declarations. I don't know if that's a record, but FEMA told me they can't find any state that's ever had that number. And we've met every single one of those challenges. We've delivered progress for our people. And before I conclude, I, I, I know that I have here tonight um, so many people who worked in the administration, people who have served in the legislature, people who have served on commissions and so forth. From the very bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for your service. You all have just been terrific. Um, and one of the greatest blessings that I have known is, th is just having the ability to work with you all, to know how much you care about this state and its people, to see you get up every day and go to work, to make sure that we can say the things that we are saying tonight. Um, and in particular in the room tonight are the two people who've served as chief of staff for me. Uh, ben Nevers, who was my senator uh, for 12 years, eight of which I was in the state house, and we worked together in the legislature, and he served as chief of staff that first four, year, um, first four years. I'm sorry, first year. It seemed like four, didn't it, Ben? <laughs> um, and just did a tremendous job um, despite the very difficult circumstances. Thank you, Ben. And then for seven years after that, Mark Cooper has been my chief of staff. I don't think chiefs of staff ever last seven years. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for your wonderful friendship and your work. I look across the room and I know many of the folks here today were present when I gave my first inaugural address at the Capitol in 2016. In that speech, I talked about how my West Point education and Army experience influenced the way that I think, the way that I govern. Um, in military terms, and we all know this, victory is won by getting timely and accurate information. Uh, you've got to formulate a sound strategy and you've got to employ the tactics necessary to succeed. I endeavored to employ that formula in every decision that I have made, from COVID to hurricanes to the budget and everything in between. I looked at situations from every perspective and collectively with the best advisors a governor could ask for and made decisions that I felt would best serve the people of Louisiana. And one thing I can tell you, for good or for ill, we never looked at a poll to tell us what we should do to address these situations. Never one time. 
In that first inaugural address, I quoted General MacArthur's farewell address to West Point when he said that in challenging times, leaders have to work to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. Little did I know how much those words, so ingrained in me during my formative years at West Point, would ring true as I embarked on this mission of leading our great state over these past eight years. But more than my military experiences, I leaned on my faith. Some people have called me the crisis governor because of all the challenges that we faced over the past eight years. When I took office on January the 11th of 2016, none of us could have predicted the obstacles we would have to overcome. But God knew. He knew what was ahead. I put my trust in him, and I will be forever humbled that he and y'all saw fit to entrust me to lead and to serve Louisiana during those trying days. And my prayer at the beginning of this journey, and really every day since, was that of Solomon. But I'm going to use my words. And I know Brother Rodney has heard me say this. Just give me the wisdom to know the right thing to do and the courage to do it. Together, we have righted so many wrongs. We built on the future while maintaining what makes Louisiana great. The sugar cane still grows. The Red River still flows. Tourists still flock to Mardi Gras. The Tanchebo pear strawberries are still the best in the world. <laughs> The good times still roll. And yes, we have challenges to be sure. But this beautiful melting pot of cultural gumbo that we are blessed to live in has never been better. We did put people over politics. And without question, by almost every available metric, we leave Louisiana much better than we found it eight years ago and stronger than ever in many, many respects. And as a result, I leave the governor's office as optimistic as I have ever been about our future. After all, the breeze of hope is still blowing. And I have every faith that that will continue. Louisiana, I will forever be your humble servant. But for now, and I say this to all my friends here, here in Amy, I'm coming home with a grateful heart for the opportunity that I have had to serve this wonderful state and all the beautiful people who inhabit it. God bless you all, and God bless the great state of Louisiana. Thank you.